is it's Wednesday. Yeah, it's Wednesday. It is a wonderful Wednesday evening. Glad y'all are here with us. Let's go ahead and run through a couple of quick technological checks. First and foremost, if you can hear the words coming out of my mouth, feel free to type in yes, hello. Give me a, a reading, five by five. Should be hopefully good. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, Tony, Bob, Robert, and Warren. Awesome, awesome. Lots of people flying by. It looks like the audio is working. Now, how about let's check the video. Do you see a fuzzy pink clock moving across your screen? Yes, 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 yes. Yep, sure do. Awesome. All right, great news. The hardest part of the evening is over. We have a good audio, we have a good video, <laughs> and we have Lorna Bot. The evening is all officially looking up. All righty, y'all. So I want to let you know really quick a couple of things before we get started. I also want to let, tell you this webinar presentation is entirely being recorded. You don't have to worry about making your own recordings or screen captures or any of that. We got your back. Uh, we always take the recording, clean it up a little bit, edit, render, encode, upload, post, and then email out to you when it is ready. That could take a day or two in the uh, uh, for that process to take place for it to get into your email inbox. If you don't see an email from us in the next day or so that says recording, replay, Danielle, simpler trading, anything along those lines, give a quick check to your spam bulk junk, clutter, promotional, et cetera, email folders. Sometimes their emails, especially uh, the webinar replay emails with a bunch of links that says click here to watch webinar can, uh, can end up in those folders unintentionally. And if you do happen to find any email from us in those folders, we are absolutely a safe sender. I promise you, you can add us to your address book or uh, click on that not spam button. Just make sure we get in there so you can receive the communication you ask for from us. Uh, we're not one of those companies that sells your information or sends you a bunch of stuff you ever asked for. So good to go on that front as well. And then lastly, we are in what's called webinar mode this evening. When our room software is in webinar mode, you will be able to type in anything you want into that little chat box in the lower left hand side of your screen. We can see it in the background here, Danielle can see it, uh, the presenter this evening. We'll definitely be trying to help you out however we can. But this is definitely a presentation with a topic and a schedule. And we are going to try our very best to stick to that topic and avoid any distractions or anything that would take away from the presentation. And that's why in webinar mode, uh, you might, it might feel a little lonely compared to the room. I'm trying to think of a, a different way than the 500 ways I've said it before. It's uh, it's definitely nothing intentional. We're not trying to isolate you, ignore you, or anything like that. But we do want to make sure we stay on time, on topic, uh, and get to the present y'all are all here for, uh, versus just having like an hour-long Q and A. Yeah, that's fun and everything, but more fun to actually get into the meat and potatoes this evening. That being said, though, Daniel has promised to spend a little bit of time at the end of the webinar, go over any questions y'all may have, kind of like an additional impromptu Q&A session. And if you look up in the alert area of the chat on the top left of your screen, the Learn About Herself has posted in our support email address and support telephone number. So if you do have any questions that are missed during the course of the presentation or during the Q&A session, I promise we're not ignoring you on purpose. It's just that when we have a lot of people all asking questions at once, it can be a little, difficult sometimes to make sure they're all answered. If you do, however, give us a call or send us an email, our amazing support staff here will help you out every single way that we can, and we will definitely answer every question that y'all have. Alrighty, so I believe we are all set, ready to rock and roll. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and get out of the way. The podium is all yours, Danielle. Take her away. Hello, everyone. How are you doing this evening? Can you hear me and see my screens? Excellent. Great. Better now. Better now. So awesome. thank you, Daryl, for that great inter introduction. All right. So let's 
go ahead and get started. Tonight, we are going to be talking about canaries in the coal mine. We're here because I want to specifically focus on a, a couple different things that are really important right now. Number one, how to take advantage of the bear market. Uh, this is probably the most important factor that we're going to talk about tonight uh, because that's the current situation that we're in. And I believe we're probably going to be here for at least a little while longer. We're also going to be talking about why I think we're going to be in this situation for a longer period of time. And a couple of those reasons include a lot of macro headwinds, including Fed impacts, inflation, earnings misses. Right now, what's happening is we are seeing a valuation reset across the board, okay? No, nobody knows exactly where the low is. They don't ring a bell there, though that would be nice, right? Uh, but we're currently in a situation where assets are being devalued until the Fed decides to change course and... At this juncture, I mean, we really don't know how much lower we can go, but we know the trend is down and we know how to trade it. One of the most important things to do in this kind of market environment is to learn how to keep your emotions in check and really just be able to be nimble and go with the flow and go with the trend instead of against it. Because in volatile times, crazy news times, uh, your emotions can really get the best of you unless you can figure out methods in which uh, you can work around that. So as a part of that, we're going to be talking about how to use tools that can help you stay objective and lead the way during volatile times. So first of all, let me just go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Danielle. I am the VP of Options here at Simpler Trading. You may have also seen any of these locations. I'm a regular on a CNBC in addition to Fox Business. I also have my own mastery program where I post uh, alerts based on low risk, high reward setups. I write the five star trader newsletter and you can find me in the options gold room and the free training room. So I am a completely self-made trader. I used to be an elementary school teacher. I learned almost 100% online um, and people ask me, you know, why? are you doing this now? Well, I do it because I love it. I do it because if it wasn't for people who came before me who taught retail traders like myself, I mean, I never would have known how. So now what I like to do is give back, trade, teach others. And of course, I love going on TV because it's always fun to, you know, get your hair and makeup done. So that's what I'm about. I love helping others. And that's why I'm here tonight. So we're going to be talking about a couple of these different trades. Um, here's just, uh, I pulled a bunch of these trades out of my um, examples that I have over the course of the past couple months once we got into the bear market. So as you can see, there's a variety of different tickers. I have also been trading a lot of the indexes. Um, and I usually focus on percentage gain because I like to trade in a small account style where I'm usually risking, you know, $500 or less. Um, and because I'm focusing on small account gains, I use a lot of multi-leg spreads. So I use uh, call credit spreads, put debit spreads, butterflies, because that's how you can really get your risk down and your reward up. So we're going to be talking about a couple of these examples over the course of the presentation. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit more detail. So I first wanted to start off with this because I don't know that anybody was expecting uh, this year to be turning out like this. But in trading, one of the things I love about it, even though, you know, you kind of hate it a little bit when it first happens, right? The only constant in life is change. So there's been some good news, some bad news, and the ugly news. Number one, the good news is that there's plenty of opportunities in the market as a trader. Definitely, as you know, just a long-term investor, you're going to be a little bit more limited right now. But the great news is, as traders, we have opportunities. The bad news is that I do believe that stocks are going to continue going lower, at least in the near future, if not for longer. And, you know, I do think they could go substantially lower. But what I really wanted to focus on here is how to take advantage 
advantage of that instead of just sitting back and, you know, watching the bleeding happen. So I want to show you a couple different charts here. The S&P futures on a weekly chart, NASDAQ futures on a weekly chart, Dow futures on a weekly chart. At any given moment in time, it can absolutely be, you know, difficult to try to determine okay, you know, which, which one's down the most? Is the NASDAQ down the most? Is the S&P down the most? What, what about the Dow? You know, where should I focus? If you have your chart set up the exact same way, I mean, even just because they have different price points and even the scale can make it look different. So it can be difficult to tell, um, especially when you're trying to compare which area of the market you should stick with, either, either to the upside or the downside. Now, there's a couple different reasons right now where the market is falling and will probably continue falling. The first of which is, is really inflation. So with inflation right now, we have the cost of goods that are just exploding all over the place. You've got rent going higher, food going higher, gas going higher. Um, and then what ends up happening is, well, prices go higher. Workers want to be paid more. And, you know, your dollars are just worth less and less over time. So the reason why all of this started at the beginning of the year was because inflation finally got so out of control that the Fed said, oh, oh no, we have to do something about this. Um, and so what they decided to do was begin a quantitative, quantitative tightening cycle. And that was the moment in time where the bottom just fell out of the stock market and it has been going lower ever since. Now, this is because with the plans that the Fed currently has, it is their goal and it is their intention to bring asset prices down because they were too high. So when that started happening, then you start seeing a couple other uh, results due to their, their actions, the actions that they have said they're going to partake on, the market started reacting. So we started seeing the 10-year note just absolutely exploding. This was also uh, majorly correlated to major tech stocks. And this has a very high impact on mortgage rates, which hit incredibly high levels, um, in addition to the fact that home prices were already exploding. So now you not only have, you know, wood's expensive, but then you also have your, you know, your gas is expensive. There's supply chain shortages. There's all these different reasons why the price of goods is going up. So the Fed's stepping in and they're saying, hey, guess what? We can fix it, even though we printed so much money and gave it away for free. So the fact of the matter is, is right now the market's incredibly volatile. It's all about the Fed. As you saw today, you know, what there was a Fed meeting today, market started short squeezing higher. And you might sit there and think, well, oh my gosh, you know, what do I do? All of these macro headwinds are are happening. I don't know when inflation's gonna end. I don't really know much about the Fed. I mean, I, I don't really know what to do. Well, I'm gonna tell you exactly, exactly what you can do, um, which is follow the trends, because what we don't wanna do, we don't want to fight the Fed. And you're going to be able to see as a trader these trends playing out, especially if you compare with strength and weakness, and you will be able to jump on them instead of, you know, having them go against you. So right now, I mean, the problem is, is that the solution for inflation is to bring asset prices down. So that's where we're at. That's what we're doing. And that's why we're seeing this kind of price action. Okay. Now, previously, we used to see sector rotation. When the market would fall, you would start to see some areas of the market that would have relative strength that we could at least focus on to the upside. Now this year, yes, we have had energy. It's really the only area. Um, but the main focus here is that because the bottom has really fallen out of everything, this is not a normal sector rotation environment where we can say, oh, it's okay that tech is down. We'll just go ahead and buy some consumer discretionary stocks because that is not the situation anymore. So that requires a shift in mindset and a shift in focus because, you know, when the NASDAQ looked like this during the bear market, sorry, bull market, um, you know, we'd have moments in time where the market would pull back and, you know, Microsoft and Apple would just come back to a nice buying spot. And all, all we did was we bought the 
kept it over and over and over because it, it worked and it worked and it worked and it worked and it worked until it didn't work, right? So that requires a new shift and a new change in new strategies. During the bull market, we were really able to focus on the gentle pullbacks, buying the dip. Always, I always looked at earnings. I looked at rallies going into earnings. I looked for stocks to trade higher, despite the fact that they had high valuations and projections of much further future growth because of all of the money printing and the fiscal policy and the exuberance. And, you know, as traders, for us, I mean, we made so much money on Peloton on the way up. It didn't matter that it was going to crash later on because at that time, that's what we were trading. So, you know, we had high momentum moves. There was a significant increase in retail trader participation and there was low volatility, but obviously everything has changed here. So what do we have to change as traders? Well, number one, I mean, you just, you have to get used to the violent moves, both higher and lower. Um, instead of, and I think this is the hardest part for traders, is when, every time the market starts rallying, you want to believe it's the end. You want to believe the bottom is in. You want to think, oh, you know, this pain cannot possibly get any worse. So when it starts trading higher, you might start, you know, thinking to yourself, oh, should, should I start buying? I mean, is this the end? But you have to flip your mindset to be able to focus on selling the rip. And you have to be able to recognize patterns that will enable you to do that. What has been occurring over the course of especially the last two quarters, but this quarter most specifically has been the fact that companies have been falling into earnings. They have been tanking, okay? They've been falling not just pre-earnings, but also on earnings themselves. So this has had a major impact on the market. And, you know, previously, if you never paid attention to earnings, you know, there would, there would be times where a crazy number would impact the index. But now, uh, because we're in such a shaky situation, earnings has become really important and it has shifted patterns pretty substantially. So we're also seeing stocks that are getting severely punished if they have high, high valuations based on projections of much future growth. And if they're losing money, still forget about it. We have a lot of high momentum moves, mostly to the downside, that we do have some quick bear market rallies. We also have a lot of fear in exiting the market from both retail traders and funds alike. There's high volatility, options, premium, and regular overnight moves. Now, I will get some flack sometimes when I say, hey, this is so similar to the dot-com bust, but, well, these are all the reasons why it's similar. Of course, there's reasons why it's not similar, you know, uh, What's that saying is that history might history doesn't repeat itself, but maybe it rhymes. No, it's not the exact same situation, but every single one of these factors are the same. You know, high tech companies began driving growth, but then the dot com stocks piled on. The dot com stocks I would consider of 2020, 2022 would be, you know, Chewy, Peloton, um, any of the e commerce, work from home, Shopify. The bubble in the year 2000 to 2002 was fed by cheap money and cheap capital, uh, just like it has been recently. Market returns fueled overconfidence. You know, it got to a point where it was like, hey, I, I know it's crazy to buy here, but it keeps going up, so let's do it. Speculation became game and valuation soared without revenue to back them. The Another similarity was also the IPO frenzy, which right now we're really starting to see those IPO stocks just get completely pummeled because a lot of them are still losing money and people bought them at, you know, outrageous prices. The NASDAQ during the year 2000 and 2001, it had doubled in a year, almost doubled. And from the low of 2020 to 2021, it did double. So then we also have the last factor that's really what's starting to pop out right now, which is that investment capital dried up. So you're now just starting to see companies coming out in earnings and saying, hey, you know what? We're cutting expenses. We're cutting employees. So we're kind of in that phase of it. So I do personally believe this is the, the dot-com you know, 2.0 bust. And uh, the dot-com stock, 
of 2022 is, I mean, Teladoc. So you can see, you know, this company, they, they are losing money. They have been losing money for a long time. And, you know, 2020 hit, everybody wanted to go to the doctor online and this thing's absolutely exploded. I mean, it went from what, $31 to a high of 308 at one point and then kaboom, it goes. So I've been trading stocks like this. This one is actually one of my best trades on the year. So it's not, you know, it's not a regular day, but um, I did want to show it because, I mean, it shows what you can do when the market falls so substantially so quickly. So this was actually on Teladoc earnings. So I had bought puts for 225 and the next day, I mean, they were worth what 20 bucks 29 dollars so when you're looking at that i mean teledoc fell 47 percent overnight so i mean there's definitely a lot of opportunity out there if you know where to look and the place that i'm really focusing on is relative weakness because during the bull market you want to focus on that strength to the upside but now that everything's falling apart you want to look for the areas that are weaker now here's a comparison of tech, consumer discretionary, and the IPO ETFs. If you're looking at this, this one's a little bit more obvious to see which one is doing worse, which is going to be the IPO ETF. The reason why I say it's obvious it's doing worse is because you know the downtrend is worse. You've broken through all of these moving averages. These ones aren't quite as bad. Certainly tech is not anywhere near um, at the levels in which the IPO ETF fell in. So, you know, for example, when I'm saying, hey, you know, I want a short Teladoc, it's because it's one of these stocks that's in this area. It's one of the weakest areas of the market. Now, here's a couple other examples. You know, you have the S&P, compare those to gold and Bitcoin. Looking at the charts, I mean, you can see that Bitcoin's breaking down worse than gold um, and worse than the S&P, but it's still a little bit hard to tell. When you're looking across the market in any given day and you're trying to figure out, you know, well, what area should I trade? You know, today CNBC is saying energy is up just on one day. I mean, that's not going to tell you the overall trend. OK, so when you're looking at the overall trend and you're thinking about, OK, what are the relative strength winners and losers of today? Uh, did anyone pay attention to what the relative strength winners and losers were today? Because I, thought, I think it was a little bit interesting today. Um, for the most part, what it has been is energy has been one of the strongest areas. Um, but today we actually started seeing a little bit of a tech comeback. We also started seeing a housing comeback. That's a XHB. And so it was really interesting because on an intraday basis, technology and housing were looking good. But if you look at it on a weekly basis, technology and housing are just absolutely some of the worst. So when you're looking at the market on a day-to-day -day basis, this can be different versus on a weekly basis. Now, if you look at this grid, this is a Phoenix Finder Turbo. Um, this is what I like to use so that I can see everything in one place because I just think it's a lot easier. And this is the grid actually just from today. I took the screenshot. This is a 78 minute chart. And what this demonstrated on this chart was that, you know, the green ones have been strong for a while. So you have XLE, XLF, they have been strong for the past, and I say a while, it's funny, three sessions in a row. Um, but when I was trying to figure out, okay, what is bouncing today? What is the relative strength winner today? That's what I want to know. Well, you actually had cybersecurity that started to light up. Um, you started to have consumer staples or trying to come back. Uh, you had the diamonds trying to come back. You have housing trying to come back. You have discretionary and tech trying to come back. Now, again, it's a shortened time frame, but... I mean, you can trade those as well. I will trade a lot of, you know, in and out butterflies um, just over the course of a week or a couple days. Here's an example of one in Apple. This is a small account trade, got in for 233 and got out for 496. So, you know, nice 113% profit 
on that on that day apple was one of those relative strength winners now you know as a trader facing change is a challenge okay I, I i more than anyone i mean i'm pretty sure i remember when i first started uh just getting you know short 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 in the trading room and everyone was laughing so hard because i mean i have been a dip buyer since <laughs> since forever i would look for any dip i would buy any dip i didn't care which sector it was i just wanted the relative strength sector but what happened was there there was nothing i mean the only relative strength sector was energy so more than anything and more than a dip buyer i am a trend follower and i've been loving trading the trend to the downside but what that means is that you know you can't get set in your ways with what you're used to doing and you have to learn to you know shift with the times and make those changes so that you can flow with the direction of the market but the key problem here is always going to be this right well how do you know which direction it's going to go well first of all i will tell you you absolutely never 100 percent know or else i would have an island in belize for sure by now but you can still use your you know tools and your best judgment to make that decision so you know i wanted to go back and and look at this because like i said i mean me like everyone else was buying the dip forever and ever and then it got to a point where it changed it shifted and it became obvious you know by the time you're all the way down here but how can you recognize it when it's shifting so I think it's really important for traders to be able to stay objective rather than, you know, subjective because we do get stuck in our own ways. And I mean, you know, for me, even I'm going to give a Microsoft example later on. I'll look at Microsoft and say, there's no way I can short Microsoft. I go along Microsoft every single order. I can't do it. I can't do it. But when you can use your tools to remain objective, that is what will help you stay on the right side of the trade. There's also, you know, a couple other problems. There's so many charts, there's so many setups, there's so many sectors. I mean, it's difficult to tell where to focus, especially when, you know, usually by the time anyone's paying attention to something, it's already moving. So what I really wanted to do is I set out to solve these issues because while you can always argue with an opinion, I mean, you can't really argue with technical parameters, bright colors flashing at you. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to help myself see something from an objective point of view, okay? What I knew I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to see relative strength because I, I love buying those dips. And I wanted to be able to see relative weakness so I could A, avoid buying them, or B, short them when the time is right. I also wanted a way to visualize when a trend was shifting on me so I could get in and out at more opportune times. And it was with this idea that my methodology was born. So I came up with a system with the idea that if you were going to go long anything, you need to be able to go long the strongest stocks in the market because you don't want to pick the loser. You don't want the runt. You don't want the slowest one in the bunch. But how are you going to go about identifying that relative strength winner? Because there's all kinds of programs, there's all kinds of tools, you know, everyone's like, what about the RSI? Okay, you have to look at one chart at a time. Yes, you can use the RSI, absolutely. But I'm saying I want to see everything in one place at one time. Because I want to see where money is flowing in and out so that I can go with it. So when I came up with this system, I decided to call it the Phoenix Finder because of the legend of the mythical bird, the Phoenix. The Phoenix it's a mythical creature. At the end of its life cycle, it builds itself a nest of cinnamon twigs, and then it burns fiercely. But the best part about it is that a new one, a young one, rises from the ashes. And when you're trying to buy the dip, you don't want to buy the dip that keeps on dipping. You want to buy the stock that's going to rise from the ashes. So that's why I started calling this system uh, the Phoenix Finder, because I want to find those phoenixes. Then what ended up happening was you know, for a while, I, I ignored the canaries. I was like, oh, no, that's a canary. I don't want to buy it. Sometimes avoiding sometimes avoiding buying a weak trick ticker is better than, uh, you know, shorting it, right? 
But now with all the changes in the market, what I'm doing now is I'm shorting the canaries in the coal mine. Now, if you have your mythical phoenix, what's the opposite of that? Well, the canaries in the coal mine, those were the birds that the miners would carry down into the tunnels with them, and those birds would alert them when the gases got too dangerous. They would roll over and die, poor birdies. And that would alert the miners that the danger was there and they needed to get out. So I'm calling these weakest links, the canaries in the coal mine for that reason. So let's go ahead and shift back and talk about what the market looked like in March of 2022, okay? Because at that time, I know there was a lot of hope in the market, okay? This was right before earnings season. The market had been falling for January, February, March. We were right around, you know, halfway through the middle of March. And I always look for a rally going into earnings season. I've done it every single quarter since I've been a chair. And I was looking at this and I was thinking, oh my gosh, there's a squeeze. Volume can pop out and maybe we can break out here because we have earnings and maybe we'll be right back where we started and it'll be all fine. Well, I'm sure you know what happened after that. So remember what it was like to, to look at chart patterns during that time. Um, and what ended up happening was I took one long Microsoft the stock, you know, my, one of my top holdings, the one I trade every year. And I was looking at the market and I said, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the market's going to go lower. All my signals are saying it's going to go lower. But if anything breaks out, it'll be this one. And what ended up happening? Well, it hit resistance right here, rolled over and died, falling into earnings for the first two quarters in a row since the beginning of time, really. Um, and so that was the long that I took in the beginning of April. And after that, I was like, you know what? No, I'm sticking with my signals, sticking with the trend, I'm sticking with direction. I lost money and I got out. So, of course, you know, there's going to be losers as well. Normally, I'm risking about $500 per trade. I try to cut stops um, if I have around 50% loss. But that's not always possible, especially when there's a big gap in the market. So that's why I always tell traders, you know, you have to risk what you're what you're willing to risk, especially in this market environment. But that's why I stick with, you know, flat five hundred dollars pretty much per trade. So if you go back and if you look at a couple of these different setups, these were setups that I had in March. And I remember the hope out there because, you know, we were looking at lows and thinking, OK, it has weekly squeeze. I mean, it, it's holding up well. I mean, surely it'll be right on its way to 275. Um, what about Airbnb? Airbnb had a weekly squeeze. You know, it looked like maybe it could potentially start carrying the market higher. But you know what? Even just if you look at an individual, and when I say an individual setup, I mean just one chart like this, Airbnb or like Lowe's. Of course, you need to take those those parameters into account. But when you look at the Phoenix Finder and you see okay, well, this was the point in time where we were looking at Lowe's and Airbnb. And this was back in uh, March. And then what ended up happening was every single sector, every single industry group, except for energy and staples, drop. It wasn't just Airbnb. It wasn't just Lowe's. It was everything starting to drop across the board. So when I say, you know, you can use you know, comparison tool all on one screen to help you with even just an individual trade. Um, this is what I mean, because of course you can look at the Airbnb chart and say, oh, well, you know, maybe as long as it stays up here, it'll, it'll probably be okay. What the Phoenix does is it kind of smacks you up the head and says, hey, guess what? The entire market is falling apart. And that's exactly what it looked like in January as well. So in January, this from January 10th, um, this had alerted to a major sell signal in the NASDAQ on January 4th. So, you know, right at the beginning of the year, it had alerted that the cloud and the cybersecurity and housing were the weakest areas of the market along with XLC. 
And it's so crazy because I remember even at this time, I mean, I didn't listen to my tool, of course, because I was in my dip buying mode and I was thinking, you know, it's January and January is always so strong and we have earnings coming up and, you know, it's okay. It'll be fine. It'll, this is just another dip. Obviously this was not just another dip, but I show this because this it's, it's not a person. It is an objective trend following, you know, measuring tool and it lights up and it'll kind of make you check yourself. So where have the, where has the opportunity been? The opportunity has been in shorting those canaries and sticking with those relative weakness areas. Now, XHB, this is the housing sector. This is one major area that I've been sticking with um, to the downside. Now, I just showed you on that previous chart that XHB had triggered to the downside the first week of January and the second week of January. Now, this grid is actually the home builders grid with all of my top home building stocks on here. And what you can see is that there, um, you can see how much each one is down from the all time high and when they triggered and if they ever tried to rally even just a slight bit so you could short it again. So one area that I've been focusing on shorting is Home Depot. Now I like to stick with the trend. I I like to try to get in on rallies. Um, it hasn't been as possible the last two weeks just because we haven't really rallied at all until the past few days. But I do like to get in on rallies because I like to have conservative entries and then I also like to have conservative targets in this market. So for this one, you know, 88% on a butterfly. Um, this one only cost me $2.90 a contract. So pretty cheap as far as a small account trade and you know just quick in and out in a couple of days now there's another one that i wanted to look at uh which is going to be lows so when you're looking at and you're trying to compare that people ask me this all the time especially on cnbc they're always like which one's better lows or home depot the easiest way for me to figure it out is just by relative strength or weakness so when you're looking at home depot and lows for example um right here you can see that th that lowe's was yellow and it was green while home depot was all kinds of red so what that means is that lowe's was just a little bit stronger than home depot so that's why i was shorting uh home depot instead of lowe's so when you're looking at you know another weak link one of the other weak links that showed up at the very beginning of the year was communications this was before Netflix got creamed on earnings. It was before Facebook got creamed on earnings. You were still looking at the turbo and saying, okay, what sector of the market is the weakest? In January, it started alerting that XLC was the weakest. And by the time we had gotten to the end of March, what ended up happening was we had this pullback, right? And then we got a rally. And at that moment in time, you're looking at it thinking, hmm, what should I do? Should I go long here and, you know, target new all-time highs? Or should I look for the canary because now the market has rallied and it might roll back up? Oh, I'm not really sure what's going to happen, but I'm going to watch for my signals. And I'm going to keep an eye on housing and uh, communications because those are the weak links. So what I ended up doing at that moment in time, and this screenshot is from uh, May 17th, as you can see, that area that I outlined on the previous slide was literally the high. So what once the market started rolling, uh, Phoenix starts demonstrating, okay, you know, don't worry too much. This one's not so bad yet. It's still strong. Oh, sorry, rolling over. Still strong, rolling over. Strong, rolling over. So what I ended up doing was I started shorting Facebook. I shorted Netflix a couple of times. I also started shorting Disney because Disney was weaker than all of them. You see how Disney started turning yellow before Facebook, before Google, before Netflix. So I shorted um, Disney, got in, got out. Just I think that was about a two and a half week trade. That was a small account trade for 90% profit on a fly. Then I did uh, Facebook. So Facebook, same thing. On this one, I actually sold a call credit spread. 
and it was in and out in less than two weeks, and that one's sixty four percent. So I'm you know I'm not trying to go for like five hundred percent, even though with butterflies you can that, and that's the number one criticism I get. People say, oh, it's you know it's so impossible to pin a, a butterfly. You don't have to pin a butterfly. All you have to do is get it into the zone and um, trade it within a range. If you pin it, which means it closes at the exact target um, on your center strike at the exact day of expiration, that's how you get the max profit. But I, I don't need that. I'm looking for you know 50 to 100% small account trades making progress in this crazy market. So what's really important about this? Um, the reason why we follow the trend is because stocks don't move because they want to, they move because they have to. They move because big money is making big decisions which reverberate throughout the market. They move money that as us, for us as retail traders, we could only dream of, okay? I mean, I say that with love because on one hand, I don't even know if I would enjoy, you know, managing billions and billions of dollars of someone else's money. I, I prefer to trade my own, but the moves that we make do not move markets. It's the moves that funds make, the market makers make. They're the ones that move the markets. So what we have to do as retail traders is have to recognize those moves, which present themselves in the form of trends and relative strength and weakness and jump on them. Because I don't know what's going to happen next. Yes, I'm bearish. But if, you know, hey, if the market starts shifting to the upside, I'll start buying it again. Um, and we have to be able to look for clues as money is flowing in and out of places and notice the shifts so that we can know where to jump on. So for a couple different examples, you know, we've got bear market movers. I've been shorting ARC quite a bit. Um, I shorted it a couple days ago. I'm a little bit down on that one right now, but that's okay. I think there's still plenty of time for it to roll. When you're shorting things, you're going to get caught on the wrong side of a short squeeze sometimes, but that's where, you know, risk control and coming coming into it with enough time is going to give yourself the best opportunity. So the thing that's so crazy about the market right now is it's not just Teladoc. It's not just Netflix. It's tanking. You know, we've got Microsoft down, Apple down, Amazon's almost cut in half. Um, it's it, these COVID darlings, what I'm calling the dot-com stocks, the dot-com 2.0 stocks, these stocks are the ones that are just complete trash that, you know, fall 20, 30 percent a day. Those are the stocks that, uh, you know, if you're crazy, if, if you're aggressive, if you want to try to get those 800 percent, you know, winners overnight, this is where you can look. Um, it's going to be a lot more wild, though, than trying to just follow the trend lower on Apple. So here's a couple different examples because there's so many different ways that you can do this. Um, and that's why I really like the tool because some people will say, hey, you know, I really like to day trade. Can I day trade? Yeah, you can day trade. I don't really like day trading personally because I just find it stressful. I like being a swing trader. But um, you can totally day trade with Phoenix Finder or just, you know, you can day trade butterflies. Usually, in the bull market, my duration on flies was going to be between three and four weeks. But now, with how things have changed, I'm doing usually about three weeks or less. Sometimes I will do seven days or less, but I use I, I like to at least give myself a week. Um, I give myself a week of time for example, but then I might get in and out in three days, if that makes sense. Because you need to give yourself, you know, enough time in case it goes against you for it to recover. So here um, is a, here are a couple different examples, okay? So one of the reasons why I started shorting ARC was because, I mean, here's a watch list. A lot of these stocks on it are, are in ARC, you know, they're down five, six, seven percent. And coming in and trying to short Shopify, I mean, it's, it's a lot, right? So how can you do it in a way that's more conservative? You're going to be able to sleep at night. Well, you just short the ETF. So what I have been doing on ARC is I've just been shorting it on the way down. When it rallies, short it again. You can also short it on a break to a new low, which is actually what I was to do the other day. But sometimes it'll find support at that low. That's why shorting it on a rally is going to be a little bit better. 
But here's an example of an arc short back from, um, what was this, the beginning of March. So I was doing that because a lot of the different ARC stocks had earnings. And I was looking at what was happening with earnings, and I looked at the Phoenix Finder, and it was like, nope, there's no way these things are going to hold up. So, you know, it's a, it's a low-risk way to get your hand in the pot, risking, you know, less than $500 a trade, make $377, um, and move on with your day. So... This is a grid of the Phoenix Finder Turbo. This is the ARC folio. Um, and when you're looking at, you know, obviously we've got spiders in a downtrend. What has happened recently is finally, over the course of the past couple days, some of these ARC stocks have started rallying. Now we know for a fact these stocks are canaries. They're literally the worst stocks in the market right now. So what I'm doing at this very moment is I'm looking at these rallies and thinking, oh my gosh, yes, you know, where where can I short it? Don't want to get and start buying, you know, a million shares of Teladoc thinking that this is a low. I'm looking to short the short the rip. So here's a couple other examples of what I would consider the dot com stocks. Again, I traded these pretty conservatively. This one's a 52% with the fly, you know, definitely relative weakness there in and out. That one was just a couple day trade as well not a day trade, but a couple of days. Uh, PayPal, this one's had relative weakness since last summer. So I shorted this one with a butterfly. Um, this one was right at about $500 risk and just a little bit over $500 profit. And then the other thing that I've been doing a lot of, because in the market craziness, I mean, Trading the individual stocks is is fun, especially when it goes in your direction. But I mean, it is volatile out there, right? So you can also just only trade um, the indexes and sectors. I mean, I've been trading a lot of the queues. I've been trading a lot of the spiders. You can just trade the semiconductors. You can just trade housing. You know, you can just focus on those areas. And with the queues, I mean, I've been doing this on a pretty regular basis for the past couple months. And, you know, I've definitely had a few that got me on a short squeeze. But for the most part, when you're looking at, um, you know, something like Apple, for example, Apple is one of the major leaders of the queues. When it started breaking this support zone, I mean, that was the best time to just get short the queues. Yeah, sure, I could have shorted Apple instead. You know, I saw Apple breaking down and I just went ahead and went with um, the queues instead. And that one, I'm pretty sure I was holding that one for like five days. So here is another example. Um, there was a moment in time where, you know, this was that rally at the end of March. And then what happened was, well, the trend started shifting. Phoenix started alerting. And so I went ahead and got short. And I mean... Sure, I could have stayed short all the way until down in here, but I'm looking for in and out. I'm trying to get the meat of the move um, and, you know, keep making progress in this in this market. So that one was 107 percent. Um, then here's another one uh, trading on the spiders. You know, again, small account trade. This one was three hundred and eleven dollars a contract. Um, and then two contracts, so it was about $700, 114%, and, you know, same thing with those. So I have a Phoenix grid as well that does just futures um, because, well, if you look at the futures indexes, um, these are going to move, like, pretty quickly. You can put them down on a five-minute chart or a 15-minute chart if you want to. I don't normally trade that small of a time frame, but you definitely can. Um, and I find it really helpful when trying to determine direction on an intraday basis. So on this grid, I mean, you can compare the VIX, you can compare the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Russell, then, you know, you get into your metals, um, you get into your uh, bonds, your treasuries. You can also look at, you know, natural gas, corn, wheat, all that kind of stuff. So the number one question that I always get about the Phoenix Finder is how does it work? Well, it just from my idea, which is I wanted to, first of all, have color-coded candles that 
would tell me how strong the trend was and if there was volume coming in or coming out on those specific bars. So first I had Eric code for me these candles, which are called the trend string turbo candles. And what they do is they shift colors based on the strength of the trend. Okay. They work based on price and relation to the moving averages. They use the Fibonacci number series. They also look at if the moving averages are stacked, um, if the moving averages have shifted, they also look at volume and then momentum. So the Phoenix Finder is powered by these candles. But like I was saying earlier, if you're looking at just one chart, sure, you can look at AMD, but that's not gonna tell you if AMD or Nvidia is better. So what the Phoenix Finder does is it takes the data from the candles. And you know, on this chart, you can see that, for example, this was red, this was a confirmed sell. It's shifting trends right here. It turns bright green. And, you know, then you're in an uptrend until you start getting these signals that, hey, you know, guess what? Maybe you should take profits. So what it does is it takes that data from the candles and then it populates it all on one place. So the other things that I added to this was I really wanted to have a percentage based comparison. So I wanted to be able to see, you know, okay, I can see that Apple's dipping and I can see that Microsoft is really dipping, but which one is getting hit worse? So on this screenshot, Apple was only down 7% from highs, but Microsoft was down 13% from highs. And in this screenshot, Tesla uh, was down 17% from highs. So you can also easily go through and say, oh my gosh, look at Chevron and John Deere and Caterpillar and XOM. If I want to be long, that's the place to be, not up here. So the trend is just really important because, I mean, it has to do with earnings. It has to do with funds. I mean, funds and big money, they are buying stocks on the regular basis that are doing well on earnings. So even if you don't pay attention to earnings, you don't care, you don't trade on whatever, like big money buys stocks that, that you know, the company's growing. And so that's why you're going to see a nice steady trend because you're going to see regular buying coming in on a, on a regular basis, which is what continues to push it higher. You also have stock buybacks and retail traders and, and uh, 401ks and stuff like that. But, you know, the big money buying it on a regular basis is going to really help that trend. So, for example, here's, you know, three different charts. You've got Delta, United Airlines, Alaska, or sorry, American um and if you're looking at the airliners like this is such a common question i get on tv like which airliner do you like the best and make a joke you know well i don't know come up with a better joke but you can talk about your personal preference or you can actually look and see okay which one's stronger super hard to tell just from this grid um not hard to tell on this grid so when you're looking at you know a variety of different grids like this one for example is the home builders grid um what i like to do is i like to i like to create different grids of similar stocks and put them together because i'm not really interested in comparing you know etsy to alaska airlines it's just not going to make that much of a difference what i want to compare is okay here's a retail chart i want to see which Retailers are the absolute worst. Where is the most trash? Oh, super easy to see. And where are the ones that, you know, could maybe possibly, possibly start coming back? So not only does it help, you know, identify the relative weakness to short and identify the relative strength to get long, but it also helps you get out. Because, you know, let's say if you're long, like let's pretend everything's hunky-dory and so great, you are just you know, completely flat out along the semiconductors and then all of a sudden they just, all of them drop like a rock. So the question is, you know, how do you know where to look? Every trader is different. Some traders will say, hey, you know, I love trading energy. I've been trading energy all year. I mean, there is nothing wrong with that at all. That's why I have a variety of Phoenix folios. So the Phoenix folios are what I call the specific grids that I've created. Here's just a couple of them on the list. There's the big picture. The grandma loves it list is the mega cap stock list that any of the companies on the list, I'm sure if you ask your grandma, 
she would know what the what the company was she, she maybe not know about cloudflare um or you know snowflake but if you talk to her about john deere she's gonna say oh yeah i have some john deere stock and i say this with love because my 93 year old grandmother is always asking me about um you know stock and netflix and stuff like that so that's why i named it after her anyways I have a futures grid, home builders, arc, cybersecurity, financials, semiconductors, energy, retail. And, you know, they've changed over time. I mean, there was a, before the pandemic happened, I, I kept this slide in here because I just thought it was like a blast from the past. Before the pandemic happened, I was trading this millennials love it list every day. I was trading airline stocks, payment processors, credit card companies, online shopping, used cars. I mean, I was traveling all the time. And obviously that was completely dead and gone once the pandemic happened. But I went back to look at this just because I thought it was hilarious because this is in uh, March of 2019. And I mean, PayPal, Etsy, Chegg, Fresh Pet, Ross, TJ Maxx, these were the stocks to trade, okay? And well, <laughs> they're not. They're, they're the stocks to trade to the downside now, but it just shows how over time, you know, our focuses, our areas change. You know, there's been times where I'm trading cloud, I'm trading the semis, I, then I'm trading work from home, then I'm trading pandemic stocks, then I'm, you know, trading industrials, large caps, tech stocks. Where is 2022 going to take us? Well, pretty much all year I've been shorting ARC stocks. Um, now I'm just to the point where I'm, you know, focusing a lot on the indexes. I hate to short the large caps and the mega caps, but that's kind of where we're at right now. I have no idea where the rest of the year is going to take us. I'm not the kind of trader that I'm, you know, going to sit here and try to make a prediction of, oh, you know, I think Facebook's going to double and blah, blah, blah. That's not what I do. I trade from one decision to the next. I trade money flow. I trade direction. I trade trend. And even though I am very bearish, I do not care if the market, you know, completely flips around and starts trading to the upside because I'll trade it that way too. So I like to trade pullbacks. I also like to trade con trend continuation. And in this market, they're not really pullbacks anymore. They're rips. You can also trade bear market rallies. Right now we've started to see a couple different bear market rallies or short squeezes higher. And Allison in our trading room, she has been just killing it with these SPX day trades. And I told you earlier, I don't usually day trade, but I figured, hey, it's volatile. Why not try the butterfly strategy on a day? So uh, this one was actually one of my day trades this year where I got in for 545 and then it cash settled uh, for a max profit because I did actually get a perfect pin on this, which means that I was targeting 4300 and it closed right at 4300. So like I said earlier, you know, people will say, oh, you need it to close right at 4,300 for it to make money. Well, yeah, that's when you can cash in and when you can get, you know, 356%. But this is the unusual trade. Most of my trades, I, you know, in for the 25 to 75%, 100 if I can. And if I can get some of these, even better, I'm not gonna complain. So in that instance, we did start to see, you know, the NASDAQ just started to rally higher. Uh, we started to see a lot of this strength, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go ahead and get long the SPX. So as far as where we're going now, we're definitely at a key low. I mean, we're oversold. Um, we have, you know, everybody short. This is a spot where absolutely could see a bear market rally. Is it going to happen? I don't know. But I do know that I'm human just like you. And I mean, I know that I can see the market through my own rose colored glasses, especially when I'm on fire and I'm like shorting this and shorting that. And it's that's why you have to work really hard to be able to stay objective uh, because you really have to pay attention to the when, the where, the why, and the how that can turn on those flashing lights. And I mean, I love this quote from John uh, because he says, you know, if the setup is still valid, ignore your emotions or they will betray you. He says this all the time, ignore your emotions. They will betray you. It was very hard for me to learn how to do that when I was starting out. And so I have worked very hard to put systems in place so that I can ignore those emotions when they come up. 
because I knew that that was my Achilles heel and that's why I wanted to create this system. So, you know, I would just tell you at this point, you know, what are your goals? You know, do you want to have a tool to help you identify stronger and weaker links? Do you want to have something on your side that is going to help you avoid your natural human emotion that's very strong and crazy market right here? And do you want to learn how to jump on opportunities at distinct turning points in the market? Now, it's crazy because in the beginning of the year when the market first started shifting, it was like, oh, no, what is happening? The, the bull market is leaving us. And now at this juncture, I mean, I have been loving trading this year. January, a little bit rough. Not going to lie. That was that one did, you know, that, that when the trend finally breaks, it's it's always very sad. But at this point, I mean, hey, bring on the bear. I've been trading the bear market to the downside. Um, had to adjust a lot of different strategies to do it, but, but it's been going well. And that is why I am bringing to you for the first time ever the bearish version of the Phoenix Finder. This class is going to be called the Diamonds in the Rough, all right? There's no way that I could call it the Phoenix Finder because we're not really looking for phoenixes. We're looking for those canaries in the coal mine. We're focusing on the tips, tricks, and tools that you can use and put into use in a bear market. Now, of course, the tool will do it both ways. So when we see those bear market rallies or even if the Fed just completely changes course and, you know, all of a sudden we're at new all time highs, you're going to have the ability to identify and trade in that direction as well. So this class is going to be on Saturday, June 4th, and I'm going to be having live trading on June 8th and June 9th. With the basic package of this class is absolutely going to come with the Phoenix Finder Turbo. It is going to come with the Trend Strength Turbo Candles, and it's also going to come with my Phoenix Folios. The Phoenix Folios are going to be the hand-selected lists that I have created. It looks just like this. Very nice. So here, for example, is the grid, the uh, Phoenix Turbo Market Leaders. So basically all you do is just download my list and then just put it right into your thinkorswim and you can save all of own Phoenix Finder grids. So basically what that would look like is you just go into your list and then all of a sudden you have, you know, Phoenix Finder Turbo, Phoenix Finder Semiconductors, Phoenix Finder Cybersecurity. Because, hey, I mean, you might love trading the cybersecurity stocks. I haven't been doing it too much lately, but the tool will show you the way. So during this strategy class, what I'm going to be focusing on is how to use the tool and how to trade in this market condition. I'm going to be starting with number one, you know, the major macro factors that you have to keep in mind right now. What correlations do you need to be paying attention to to help you identify which direction things are going, okay? Then we're going to be talking about top-down analysis. How do you identify which sectors and which indexes are the strongest and focus on those? And then if you don't want to stop, you can either A, stop at the sector and trade that, or B, learn to identify the best stock in the sector to short or to go long. So that's what we're going to be doing in the class. I'm also going to include a very special session on my butterfly I hate to say butterflies 101 because it's not 101. It's more of a, you know, everything you need to know about flies to, to use them in this market environment right now. So we're going to be talking about swing trading with butterflies. Um, and, you know, you can even throw in spreads here if you want. But the reason why I use a lot of butterflies is because, like I said, they're low risk, they're high reward, they hold up up the best during market volatility. They're significantly cheaper than buying long puts. Um, so it just, for me, all around just works a million times better. So usually, you know, I'm trading small account style. I, I don't usually get out before three days is over. It's usually between, you know, three days and, you know, week and a half, two weeks in this market environment. Um, 
And like I said, you know, the class definitely comes with the turbo. You need the turbo with the class. So, you know, it all comes together. You also are going to get the candles that come with the Phoenix Finder because, I mean, hey, they power it. So definitely want to um, get that. Then when you are looking at the pro package, the pro package is going to include live trading. So during the live trading um, I really like doing these sessions because what we do is really just focus on using the tool and the strategies in a live market environment I have no idea what the market's going to be like on June 8th or June 9th but I mean hey if uh, it's a big rally day maybe we're going to be shorting the rally if it's a big day where the market's careening lower uh, maybe we're going to be looking at next targets to the downside I have no idea which is why those live sessions are great because you can actually use uh, the tools and a strategy in the live market environment. And oh yeah, by the way, here's the link to the class page if you would like to learn more, simplertrading.com slash diamond. You can, well, you can't click on it, but Sarah posted it up above and Lorna has posted it as well. And you can go to that and read more about the tools in the class. So I also, in this package, um, in the elite package, I have included a membership to the Stack Profits Mastery. Now this is actually $200 off from the regular membership. So you would get not only the class and the tool and the live trading, but you would also get a membership to my mastery for a quarter. So in my mastery, uh, just kind of depends, you know, what's going on in the market. I mean, sometimes super active. Sometimes there will be a few days where it's a little bit quieter. But what I do is I post a weekly watch list. Um, I let members know, you know, what are the areas of the market that I'm looking at. I let them know which tickers are coming up on earnings that are potentially market moving. Um, I also post my in-depth media research notes. I spend a lot of time doing research to appear on uh, CNBC, Fox, and all that stuff. And I write up really detailed notes, and I send those over to the members as well. Uh, because, you know, I can't trade everything. I trade um, as much as I can, of course, but, I mean, I can't overutilize my portfolio. So what I like to do is, even if I have other ideas that I'm not specifically trading, I like to give those to the members as well. So... You're also gonna have a watch list. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, at Trader Danielle, watch out for the fakers. You have to spell my name right, which is, here, I can spell it for you. I'm sure you can find it somewhere else, but there are lots of Twitter scammers, so just make sure you um, spell my name right. But it's at Trader Danielle, so you can definitely uh, message me, ask me any kind of questions. On Twitter, I tend to get back to Twitter pretty quickly. I try to answer my emails as soon as I can, but I get a lot of email and a lot of them are very long. So sometimes it's just easier for me to answer a very quick tweet. Um, if you have any questions, uh, my email is going to be danielle at simplertrading.com. Just, just, sorry, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to write with a mouse. But Danielle at uh, simplertrading.com if you have any questions. And also we have our amazing team here in the background. But the moral of the story is, is that, you know, you get the class. You can customize your own grids. If you want to trade the gold miners, that's something that people ask me about that I just don't trade. If you want to make your own utilities grid, anything like that, they're super easy to adjust. Um, all you do is just right click. Go to studies, edit studies, go down to your Phoenix Turbo. And then what you can do is you can just pick whichever tickers you want to put in here. So you can, you know, make it, I don't know, crypto coins or whatever you want. And then you just swap out the names, you swap out the title, you save it, you save your own grid, and then wham bam thank you ma'am you have your own grid that you have then created and then you can come and save each grid uh under a different name so that when you're doing your research and you're you know trying to find a, a different area of the market that you wanted to trade um 
you can just swap over to that grid and say, hey, you know, the uh, home builders were rallying today. So let me see if there's anything in here that I could actually start shorting. Um, and then you, you know, can identify which stickers are trading higher. And, you know, there you go. So if you have any more questions, um, you know, if you already have one of the indicators, if you have something similar, a lot of questions I get are, um, you know, A, can I use the 10X bars? Can I use the grab candles? Can I use whatever other candles you have? You absolutely do not have to use my candles in any way, shape, or form. Um, if you want to use whatever candles you already have up here, that will not change or impact the Phoenix Finder down here. So you can still use the Phoenix Finder as is and use, you know, whatever other candles you want. I just wanted to include them because, I mean, they go together and they match. As you can see with XHP, do you see the colors of the candles? Red, yellow, red, and you see how it matches down here? That's because it's pulling those colors from these candles. So I wanted to include it. If you have another candle, don't worry. Uh, you can email support at Simpler Trading. Um, and you can you can email your support at simplertrading.com. You can also call them as well. Or you can tweet me or email me if you have any questions. You can also go to this link. So trading.com slash diamond what percentage of the portfolio are you using during live trading i i never go over like 20 percent there there are there are times where during the bull market i would get up to like 50 60 percent location but i never go over you know 20 percent and that's because i'm trying to you know make progress and if you have 50% of your options portfolio allocated and then a short squeeze hits, I mean, it's not gonna be a great day. So I try to make regular consistent trade, getting in, getting out. Um, I, don't, I don't do anything too crazy. There are definitely times where, you know, maybe I didn't um, wait until the perfect rally to short something like, you know, maybe I could have shorted it a little bit better spot. But for the most part, I mean, I, I really don't do anything too crazy or risky. I just try to have my, you know, regular trades on a regular basis. Um, I like to cycle in and out of trades. So that I'm constantly, I hate to steal Allison's word because Allison uses a recycling risk. But um that's just kind of what I'm doing. I'm getting into some trades and out of some trades, into some trades and out of some trades on a regular basis. So awesome. You're joining us. Okay. Hey, that'll be great. Very excellent. Looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to teaching a class. I haven't taught a class in a, a long time. Um, I think the last time I taught a class was last September, October. So the market's changed a lot and I mean, definitely it's been um, crazy and it's been volatile, but I mean, I've had an awesome time just hanging out, looking at the charts, um, trading, talking to members. And I mean, ultimately the reason why I, I teach is because I get awesome feedback where people say that, hey, you know, this is, this has helped me so much. Um, so when you're looking at the tools, what is different from the original 2019? So the main thing that is different about the turbo versus the regular is going to be that this one includes uh, volume. So this one has the addition of volume where you can see these blue dots that are lighting up. So basically what it does is if you have the high volume a uh, bar right there you're gonna get a light you're gonna get a lit up candle that demonstrates that um you know you have high volume on that bar so in this volatile market you know volume is pretty important the other thing that is different is, is well all of the grids are different um 
every single one of the folios is different. The percentages were not in the original version. So looking at the percentages, what these percentages do is they compare, you know, how how high you are or how low you have fallen um, as, in relation to the previous all-time high. So that was something that was not there before. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to have a really quick visual that would show me, okay, you know, how, how much is the cloud computing sector down in comparison to the NASDAQ? Then as far as the class is concerned, um, you know, the, the original Phoenix Finder class was one of the first classes I ever taught. And um, I mean, a lot has changed since then, you know, uh, yes, the tool and the idea is the same, definitely. Um, but when it comes down to it, I mean, this class is going to be highly focused on trading the downside. Um, the original class also didn't, I, I wasn't trading butterflies at all at that time. So this one's primarily focused on uh, small account butterflies. Um, and the other one that I taught in 2019 was, you know, 100% focused on buying the dip and riding, riding like a nice, easy bull market. This one's going to be focused on uh, trading a volatile bear market. So definitely, you know, base idea, very, very similar. Um, but all of those different components are different. So the class is new. The tool is somewhat improved, uh, somewhat, somewhat better. I find it to be a lot better personally. There might be some people who say, oh, I don't really need the volume. I don't really need the percentage, but I've actually found it incredibly helpful during this time frame, especially. So butterfly 202, <laughs> yeah, butterfly 202. <laughs> Short arc to zero. Just remember that um just remember that the the support in arc is at zero yeah so if you have the original phoenix finder just like i said on that slide it says you know you can message support at tell them you have the original one and see um what they say about all of that because um we we i don't know what we're doing but I do know that there's a slide in here that says if you already have the indicators, call customer service. <laughs> I, I did awesome on Friday, hurrah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Why isn't ARC named Kathy Loves It? That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were trying to ask questions and you were interrupted. I didn't see what uh, question you asked. I love the indicators, though. I'm a firm believer they're just a, a, I am a firm believer, as in they're just a catalyst. They don't, won't make you a good trader. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, in this course, are you going to go over how you trade or would you recommend getting another one of your courses? Oh, I'm definitely going to go over it, how I trade. 100%. Yeah. I mean, usually in a class like this, the tool is going to be probably one out of six or seven chapters. Um, I'm still working on the finalizing the chapters, but usually I cover the tool in, you know, basically one chapter. Uh, one chapter is about, you know, macro sector analysis. One chapter is about uh, macro correlations. That was something that I never really did before. So that's in there. Definitely have a focus on, um, you know, specifically trading psychology and shorting the rip versus buying the dip. And um, a section on butterflies. It's not a, like I said, I don't want to call it a butterflies 101 because it's not a, I always struggle with what to call it because people will say, well, if it's 101, I already know what a butterfly is. And then if, you know, people don't know what a butterfly is, they're like, well, wait, but then it needs to be 101. So usually what I do is I explain the way in which I do the flies exactly. And then I always try to add some supplemental education um, for people who may not be familiar with butterflies at all to kind of add in that one-on-one -on -one portion, but not take away time from the class where, you know, I'm focusing on the one-on-one -on -one portion, if that makes sense. 
do you like your candle colors better than the 10x because i noted the 10x is yellow a bunch of times even though the trend is clearly bullish and should be green it seems that is 100 percent why i like mine better so um i did use the 10x bars for a long time um i used the grab candles for a while as well and then ultimately i settled on these and you know obviously if you ask anyone whose candles they use they're gonna say their own so 100 percent you know full disclosure i like my own my best my i like my own the best and i'm sure everyone else likes their own the best as well but the thing is is that different candles do um different things so johns are meant to demonstrate when there's a momentum move and um those are the 10x bars and the reason why they're yellow a lot of the time is because there's no momentum so for me i found that kind of unhelpful because what i was trying to focus on is the trend and so my candles will you know for example even on an up day in the market the candle is still red because you're in a confirmed downtrend. So the candle's not shifting green because the, the market was up today. The candle's red because you're in a downtrend. So, I mean, I always just tell people that, of course, I'm going to pick my own. In good news, the class would come with these candles and then you can just test them yourself. The reason why I like these two is because they have five different colors. So they're pretty nuanced when the trend shifts. But... I mean, I, me too. Like I like everyone I've, I've tried all different kinds of things. And at the end of the day, you just need to find what works best for you. Um, and if that's the, the trend candles, that's great. And if not, then, you know, that's totally fine too. Cause at the end of the day, I just want everyone to find, you know, what makes them a better trader. Um, what are the, which indicator do you use in conjunction with those two indicators that best gives you entry and exit points? So I, my regular grid and this, I have a base grid that's coming with the class. I can't give out, um, the squeeze pro I'm not allowed to, and I'm not allowed to give out the turbo Vizio. Um, but I have a base this exact base grid that's coming with the class minus those two premium indicators. So I use a combination of moving averages. So I have the eight, the 21, the 34, the 50, the 100, and the 200 moving averages. I use the squeeze and I use the turbo VZO. This one's actually Sam's um, trend oscillator pro. And I actually really like that one, too. I started using it a couple months ago, and I like it. But as far as entries and exits are concerned, um, what the Phoenix is meant to do is the Phoenix is meant to tell you when you are starting to get... Here, I can show you on the lower time frame chart. So, for example, if you're like me and you use this every single day, you get to the point where you know what the Phoenix is showing you without even looking at it because... So, for example, if you look at this NVIDIA chart, um, you see how it was red, goes to yellow, then goes to green. So, you could see that on the Phoenix, but you could also see it on the individual chart. And then when the VZO, or the volume, is starting to pour in, um, that's usually what I'll use for entries and exits. So, the moving averages, the candles, um, I do use the squeeze, and then I like the VZO. But if you already have the ready aim fire, the VZO and the ready aim fire are pretty similar. Um, again, if you ask me which one I like better, I like mine because I, I just do. But um, the VZO and the ready aim fire are very similar. You know, they're oscillators. They're they're trying to help you get in and out of trades. So yeah, uh huh. How to trade the Shea way? I like it. What time is the class? Uh, well, noon. <laughs> Hooray for the great support staff. Yes. You would like to know more about my mastery because you're a new trader. The indicator, is your indicator only on TOS or another platform? Um, yeah, this is on Think or Swim. As far as my mastery is concerned, um, 
As far as my mastery is concerned, it is called the Stack Profits Mastery Program. I called it that because I like to call butterflies stacking your profits because, you know, you can risk one to make up to four. Um, so I post mainly butterflies. I do, sometimes I'll do some long calls or puts or some spreads, um, but I do use a lot of butterflies. It just kind of depends on what's going on in the market. Um, I try to always update everyone at least once a day on a market update saying, you know, hey, the, there's a strict squeeze today and here's resistance or whatever the case may be. Sometimes I don't if I'm either out of town that day, which isn't very often, um, or if just nothing's happening. If there's nothing going on in the market, probably won't get an update that day, but I send updates via regular push notifications and then I also have a weekly document that I write on with key events that are come upcoming, um, key tickers to watch, tickers I want to trade, that kind of thing. Um, and then I also give the mastery members my behind the scene notes that are my, you know, up and coming media research. So like this week, I already had a box segment in CNBC. So I did a couple hours of research, wrote up a bunch of notes to the producers and then they decide what they want to put on in their show and then i give that research to the members yeah so these are called the trend strength turbo mm -hmm. does the class come with live trade alerts so if you get the pro version or the elite version then it comes with live trade alerts if you get the basic version um, then that is a Saturday class that comes with the slides and the tool, but not live trade alerts because it's on Saturday. So what we do is we take Saturday, we take the day to go through the class, um, with the markets closed. So there's not any distractions because, you know, it's pretty much impossible to teach a slideshow when the market's open. Um, and then if you would like to take part in the pro or elite version, um, that is where you get the regular live trading. So in my mastery, I do live trading three times a month. Um, and so, you know, if you did the elite, you would have two days of pro plus, I think there's another, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's another, at least three days in June. I would have to look at the calendar, but, um, then, you know, of course, you know, three more days in July, three more days in August, so on and so forth. Um, with the live trading from the class, whatever I alert out, I will, I will let you know when I close it. So, you know, if I got an entry, I'll let you know when I take an exit. Same goes for the mastery. You appreciate a great presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Steven. So if you can't make it, uh, will it be on? If you can't make it, you can still purchase the class and you can get access to um, the class folder. You can get access to the recordings. And then that way, you know, basically right after the class is done, it'll get uploaded and you can watch it at your leisure. So. I can show you what it looks like um, when you go into basically the class folder. I don't think that I have uh, uploaded everything just yet, but maybe I can show you one of my one of my other classes that I did, so you can see what it looks like. I haven't done a class in so long. All right, so here was a an earnings class that I did before. But basically, when you buy the class, you get access to the folder. You're just going to go in your dashboard and go to your classes. And then basically everything, all the videos are uploaded, all support videos. You have the strategy session. It's broken out into chapters. Um, right away, the first day after the class, it's not broken up into chapters. We work on that after the fact. But, um, you know, you also have all of your live classes here and then 
just keep scrolling down. As you can see, there's a lot. Um, then we have spreadsheet. We have all these extra documents. So normally, I add what I call homework, which is extra documents. So you know, if you're a beginner, um, if you're a beginner, this is the spot where you would really want to focus on, which would be the homework. So you could go through the homework before the class and then, you know, kind of be at a better spot before you start the class. Whenever people say, you know, are your classes for beginners? I never know how to answer that because, you know, I always try to make them more of an intermediate level. But because I used to be a teacher and because I also know very much so what it's like to be a brand new trader, I always try to make it not over anyone's head while still a higher level if that makes sense. Um, I always feel like beginners can take my classes. I know that beginners do take my classes all the time and they tell me they learn so much. And I also know, you know, people have been trading for 20 years, take them and say they've learned so much. So I, tr I try to make it kind of middle of the road. Are the pro classes different from the regular stack profits? Yes. Mm-hmm. The pro classes just for this class are different than the Stack Profits live trading. There's going to be a lot of live trading for me this month. <laughs> as far as the Thinkorswim basic instruction, um, Duncan is going to be doing some videos on that that explain, you know, how you open the Phoenix Finder, how you put it on your grid, how you put it on your Thinkorswim, how you change between grids and all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, for something as volatile as QQQ or spiders, does the indicator keep fluctuating between red and green? Oh, uh, I mean, we can look at it, but not really. I mean, it, you, you can go to, you can go to, you know, and look at the Phoenix Finder and and see if that's the case. It's going to be different on different time frames. Um, the time where it's going to be what I would call fluctuating the most is going to be when they squeeze. So this isn't even a good example because this is so directional. I mean, you can see like green, 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 red. There are going to be kind of weird times where you're going to see red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green, and you're kind of like, what's going on? Normally, if it's sh if it's displaying like that, it's because there's a squeeze. So if you go to um, the individual chart, let me see, where's my other chart? If you've never traded butterflies, will it be over my head? No, I will not make it over your head. And if you are confused, you can email me and I will help you. Okay, let's see. Sky. All right. So did you did you see how I showed you on the Phoenix Finder? It was like red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green. And you're like, what the? What is going on here? Well, it's because there's a squeeze. So if the Phoenix Finder is showing you that it's kind of all over the place, that's usually the, the best time to get involved because um, that means there's a squeeze. So it's kind of like the, the hint right there. That's why you always want to, you know, use the two in conjunction. You do an awesome job providing a ton of extra information, which is so valuable to every level of trader in your courses. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, I'm really, I, I really look forward to redoing this class because like I said, I mean, the first class that I ever taught with Simpler was the original, original Phoenix Finder. So this is like, you know, it's a strategy of 100% use the longest. I came up with it. I worked really hard to, you know, figure out how I liked it. And I mean, I've used it for a long time and it was just, it was just the, it was just the time where, I mean, things, things have changed so much. I've changed so much. So Looking for the looking forward to the 2.0 version. So if you cannot make the live trading, you can always um, just watch the recording after. But we don't do 
like a makeup live trading or anything like that. Mm hmm. Yep. Awesome. Well, if you have any other questions, let me know. You can message me on a Twitter if you have Twitter at um, Trader Danielle, or you can email me at Danielle at SimpleTrading.com. Or you know, if it's something about like you already have the original Phoenix Finder or something like that. Definitely just email support because that is going to be where you're going to get the best assistance. So you can email support at Simpler Trading or call them. Um, then PayPal plan. So this we don't have a specific PayPal plan. It's just saying that you can um, pay with PayPal credit and get 0% interest for six months. Mm -hmm. And then the indicator that I was using that Sam uses, that is gonna be the trend oscillator. Why is that not on my chart? It's weird. Yeah, so he did a class in January. Oh, here it is on my daily chart. And um, he was showing me how well it overlaps with the Turbo VZO and the stuff that I use because, you know, we've just, we've been in this regular downtrend, uh, there's been no momentum. And so I threw it on my charts after his class and I've been using it since then. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think I have kept you here for long enough. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, if I don't talk to you before then, I hope you have a fantastic Memorial Day weekend. I don't know if you have kids in school or grandkids in school, but everybody's getting out of school right now. It's the beginning of the summer. It's a great time. And um, I hope everybody has a happy and safe weekend. And, you know, next week we'll uh, get back into it. So have a great rest of your evening, and I will see you next time. Thank you for joining me tonight.